Yeah, my name is Vuk Marevic. I am with Mississippi State University. I'm an associate professor. And my research is in software radios, cognitive radios, uh, vehicular communications, um, also wireless test beds and testing, and uh, wireless, uh, wireless security. Today, I'm going to t present our new platform called AirPav. AirPav stands for Ex Aerial Experimentation and Research Platform for Advanced Wireless. Okay, and this is a collaborative project between Mississippi State University and other academics and companies. I'll talk about this in a minute. So unmanned aerial system, or UAS, or I use UAV as well, unmanned aerial vehicles as synonymous, or drones. We all probably know that Amazon wanted to fly, uh, to use drones to deliver packages. Uh, other companies have done this. Large packets are being delivered door-to-door uh, -door or in, in rural areas, or in Africa, or wherever. Food delivery is now very popular, but also medical delivery, uh, including uh, like blood or uh, vaccines and things like that from one hospital to another. There have been some experiments using drones. OK, so then, of course, NASA is looking into unmanned aerial vehicles for uh, some future applications like aerial taxis, as well as Uber and uh, Boeing and others. What are, uh, Telecom companies like AT&T and others are using drones sometimes to enhance their capacity, right? Or to deploy base stations when the, where there are no, no cell coverage, for instance, after disaster. Also, um, if you have interference, you don't, you're, you're tracking interference source, UAVs can be very helpful to localize interfere. And of course, there's also the notion of security and safety, right? UAVs, once they start flying, they can be a safety hazard, right? Uh, people, uh, airports are afraid of UAVs interfering with airplanes. Well, yesterday was a good, a good day for us because NSF announced AirPav as the, as the third power platform to be developed. And power is, stands for Platforms for Advanced Wireless Research. It's a NSF industry consortium uh, agreement to support the development of four big large-scale test beds in the US that cover part of a city and then allow experimentation and research for global researchers and for industry. So what you see here is, uh, is North Carolina, is uh, uh, around North Carolina State University in Raleigh. So they're uh, leading this effort. You see three base stations that we want to deploy by the end of, next, by end of summer, so within one year. Well, the project just started yesterday. And within one year, we'll have three towers and three drones, OK? And we're going to set them demos during a summer school and so forth. And then we'll have you guys use it and help us develop it and, and, and make your, do your experiments in a real life environment with, with drones. So of course, you see here gap. Uh, after year three, we'll have 15, maybe 20 base stations that close this gap. And this is about four, four or five miles, maybe that we'll have a range of uh, doing drone experiments along four or five miles of cellular connectivity. And when I say cellular connectivity, it's an experimental cellular network, OK? Um, and of course, there are lots of issues, like the highway we need to cross and things like that. I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but things are going to be resolved. So this was the motivation. Now, let me uh, brief give you the outline of my talk. So first of all, I need to present a team. Uh, it's a big team that's behind this and our objective. And then uh, I will most, mostly focus on the air power radios that we plan to deploy, software radios and other radios. And then some, the experimental flow, how an experimenter would use air power, like you or industry or academics or others. And finally, some research examples, why we built this. We built this to enable research and education and standardization, all those, all things. OK, our mission is to serve as a unique technology enabler for research and advanced wireless with UAVs, OK? So we want to use these 3D mobile systems, the drones, uh, that enhance, with enhanced mobility, right, in three dimensions, and use, and use an advanced wireless technology to enable the integration of drones into the airspace and, and have safe operations of, of drones and have good wireless connectivity. OK, NC State is leading this. Uh, Mississippi State is the second. Uh, uh, academic partner, then we also partnered with University of South Carolina and Purdue, and we have two, one research center 
and a software company, Renzi. So this is a team uh, of PIs, of principal investigators, Ismail and I. We have similar background. We know about SDRs and 4G and 5G um, and standards. I've been developing test beds. I used to be at Virginia Tech, and I managed a Cornet test bed, the USRP-based test bed. So then we have uh, Rudra, who is a networking specialist, an IT specialist. And we have Michael, who is a drone specialist. We have Brian Floyd, who is a millimeter wave circuit specialist. So he's building integrated circuits for millimeter wave communications. And we have two people, Tom and Robert. They're uh, FAA regulation experts, how to talk to FAA to get special permits for flying if, as needed. And we have Gerard, who is a, a wireless testing guy. So we are the principal investigators. Most of us, except these two, are professors. Uh, and then we have partners, a lot of partners from industry, telecom industry, of course, but also like cable companies or uh, fiber optic companies and so forth. And by the way, the, as I said, the power program is financed by industry and NSF. So industry is donating their latest wireless technology or fiber or ex uh, access to towers. And NSF is donating money in order to pay for the researchers and for the deployment. OK, so this all fits very neatly into 5G, we believe, because one of the things that 5G will, will enable is better connectivity and, and wider connectivity for lots of new verticals. And one of them, we envision, will be drones or UAVs. So one uh, specific aspect of UAVs is they need to be nowadays really controlled. They need to be fly. Uh, there needs to be an operator who operates an UAV and needs to be within visual line of sight of the UAV. Okay? So we are now here, manual control and visual line of sight. We are moving towards operation that's autonomous without uh, using a, a radio uh, controller, right? But then in order to be able to do beyond, beyond line of sight operation, so without visual observers, we believe that this only solution is using and testing and advancing wireless technology. This is why one of the reasons we are, we are building this test bed, in order to get real experience in a real environment. OK, so lots of options for uh, UAV uh, research and, and related to wireless communications. I mentioned the hotspots when you need extra um, capacity. Smart agriculture is a nice one. Rural areas that are not connected, right? Uh, IoT devices that you can deploy in those fields to measure the soil or the moisture or whatever in order to, to initiate some actions so you can have drones that collect the data by flying over the field. Also, of course, uh, UAV swarm operations, UAVs that uh, operate in concert to fulfill some mission. They need to have some ad hoc, at least ad hoc networking capabilities. OK, so now I want to explain what kind of radios we plan to deploy for our platform. So the objective here is to, to provide the users, the global researchers, developers, educators, uh, regulators, etc. anyone can use the platform, it's a community testbed, with a wide set of radio options and a wide set of radio environments, okay? To be able, let's say, rural environments, suburban environments, uh, and so forth. But let's talk about the radios. So here's the list of radios that we envision of course, our principal radius will be SDRs. We already received a bunch of SDRs from NI. Uh, we're using, we will use mostly X310, N310, and, and maybe millimeter wave SDRs for both the towers and for the mobile nodes and lighter versions of them. Then another big uh, provider is Ericsson. We hope to collaborate with Ericsson very tightly and get their 5G equipment for the radio and may, later for the core network as well. And then we'll have a bunch of RF sensors to sense the spectrum. IoT is a big uh, topic also, especially for rural development and, and research. Radars are important. Uh, everybody's, I mean, regulators and are afraid of UAVs not behaving, right, or not reporting themselves. Uh, so you can use radars to detect those UAVs. And then for research, again, localization is a big topic. We can use ultra-wideband transceivers for that. And eventually, after we're done with the first phase, 
if you have a special radio that you want to test in a real environment, you can bring your radio to our test beds. And uh, we, can, we need to arrange how to integrate and how to uh, allow safe, safe, safe operations, but this is definitely uh, supported. Okay, the SDRs, the regular X310s with daughter boards, uh, wideband daughter boards, then the N310s, we're excited of using those as well. And we're expecting NI to, to launch their affordable millimeter wave SDRs, possibly. And uh, um, this will be deployed on the towers because they're heavy and power consuming uh, SDRs. And then for, for, the mobile term, for the mobile nodes such as uh, UAVs, we will use the B series mostly because of the lighter form factor. And most of these SDRs need a computer, so you have to get some good computers for the towers and also for the UAVs. Okay, while there is no affordable solution for millimeter wave software radios, we're going to build our own SDR millimeter wave extenders. So we have a, a professor in our team, uh, Professor Brian Floyd. He's with NC State. He's a, a specialist in millimeter wave IC design. So he has some prototypes already to develop a very tight packaged antenna arrays for uh, millimeter wave beamforming. So he, he builds these custom antenna arrays, he uses a commercial beamforming chip, and then depending if, if the millimeter wave SDRs are available, we can use the setup directly. If not, we can use and build our own up and down conversion stages to use the SDRs that are available today. Uh, if you have any questions about millimeter wave, uh, you feel free also to contact Brian. So, so here's my specialty, it's software. So um, the, soft, the hardware is great, but software radios need also software to operate. So I'm very interested in, in using and leveraging this community, uh, working with you guys, uh, on, on, and my students already do that. They use GNU Radio for learning about software radios and developing some uh, waveforms for initial testing or for testing on the platform. Eventually, we are going to provide the testbed hardware and software or package the software in some way that, that's usable for you, for different types of users. They're novice users, right? They're expert users. So maybe may develop a GUI, graphical user interface, that helps you configure uh, an LT base station, for instance, easily without much knowledge about LT. So therefore, we're going to leverage SRS LTE. Uh, we are working with them. They're one of the partners. They have 5G available. and, and uh, they play, uh, so 4G available and 5G in the future. They're also looking at vehicular to everything communications. And open air interface is also has a lots of tools for 4G and 5G networking. Remember, we're, we're trying to build an advanced wireless test bed. We want to go very wide band and use advanced wireless protocols to maybe uh, to be able to operate with the commercial base stations, the 5G base stations, the 4G base stations, to be able to interoperate with them and allow more experiments. You can develop your own protocols and waveforms, uh, or we can develop some other waveforms, let's say jamming waveforms, and, uh, and give them to you for, for your experiments and to support research and standardization. So here are some other radios I just briefly want to um, touch upon. So one is the Keysight RF sensor. So those can be used uh, for localizing uh, drones. Uh, Keysight is one of the partners. They will supply those radios, or sensors, sorry. And then they have a handhold, handheld device that can be used in order to uh, monitor your 4G or 5G network coverage and, and, and uh, performance. So I mentioned IoT. We, we will use Sigfox IoT and maybe LoRa. So here we have some Sigfox sensors that we plan to deploy in agricultural fields. We have a field t test site, um, and then we can have either a six, six Fox base station on a drone to collect that data or uh, be su supplied from a base station tower. So this is just a capability. Then, of, then also we have uh, four-term radars, which have been designed to uh, detect drones, uh, unauthorized drones. So there are also very, uh, several companies are interested in, in, in that kind of research and, and development. And then for localization, I mentioned we have uh, ultra-wideband transceivers, and we also plan to use uh, Wi-Fi sniffers uh, to localize uh, 
ground users, for instance. OK, so enough about radios. Let me now explain how our nodes will look like, just a high-level architecture, OK? So we will have towers, and we will have mobile nodes. On the towers, which can be actual towers or can be rooftops, we plan to have uh, to offer the user radios and a workstation, a computer with virtual machines where, where he or she can develop software radio programs. And then we'll have all sorts of cabling to the, to the top of the tower with different types of antennas. We may have antenna arrays. There's a company in Santa Clara, Blue Danube. They're also one of our collaborators. They have antenna arrays and, and beamforming algorithms to extend or improve the cellular coverage. Um, then also RF monitors are important to monitor the spectrum, monitor what the user is doing, if he's be behaving, because we need licenses, of course, and we plan to get licenses from FCC to be able to operate our wireless testbed outdoors. But we need to control what the user is actually doing, right? Um, moreover, sorry, that was the tower side. Now let's look at the mobile nodes. So the mobile nodes uh, is a vehicle and the radio. And in terms of uh, UAV language, or uh, we call the radio the payload. So the radio payload will again be uh, different types of radios. Maybe it'll be a 5G handset, smartphone, or it might be an SDR, right? And there, may, and, and there will be different antenna options. As I mentioned, those small antenna patch antennas for uh, millimeter wave beamforming those we plan to build for the UAVs because they're very compact and, and light. And then there is also the autopilot and the RS that inter interfaces with the uh, RC receiver. So the autopilot will be in the hands of the operators, which is us, uh, but the radios will be programmable by the users, which is you. Um, and then we have two links, two cellular links. So one cellular link, again, will be the experimental link that you can use. And the other one will be for us to control the UAV, maybe, or to, to start and stop the experiment. So you have a link that you can develop your own, I don't know, let's say we offer you 15 base stations, and you select five of them for your experiment. So those five base stations will be kind of part of your experiment, right? But we may use other cellular networks and services around it to control the UAV and be able to abort the UAV or start the experiment and so forth, okay, as a control link. And then we have the mobile vehicles. Uh, we have UAVs, as I mentioned. We'll use mostly multicopters, so we're playing between 10 and 20 maybe multicopters that can, um, um, that can carry a weight of 10 to 15 pounds or more, but uh, the, the heavier, the fewer um, the range, or battery range, right? And there are reg regulations, right? You cannot, without permission, fly above 400 feet. And I think you cannot carry uh, higher payloads than 25 pounds without extra permissions. Then we may use also some fixed wing aircrafts. We also have helikites, which can hover very high altitude or medium altitudes or even lower altitudes, and they can hover for months. So there, we can potentially set up an aerial base station to cover the area or do some experiments with that. And so we were also suggested in, to use ground vehicles like rovers or golf carts or buses to extend our experimentation capabilities beyond just aerial. OK, so how do you use AirPower? Well, we need to ensure that everything that's developed for experimentation satisfies your needs but it's also apt for actually flying out, outdoors and, and, and doing outdoor experiments. Therefore, we offer you a development framework where you can develop your experiments. You can develop your radios if you want and with virtual machines. And you can, you can develop, define what types of, what part of a, uh, what, which resources out of a test bed you want to use for your experiment. Once you have done that, you go through the sandbox a sandbox is a safe environment which uses the hardware, the software and hardware that you want to use for experiment, but it's not outdoors. It's in a room. You don't fly drones. The drones don't fly. You just, they don't have uh, their propellers, and you don't radiate necessarily. 
once this passes uh, the test or is, is compliant with our regulation of what you wanted to do, then we go through the emula emulation stage. So here we emulate in software lots of things. We emulate the UAV flight, we emulate the channel, and so forth. One of the big test beds that does this is Colosseum, right, from DARPA. So DARPA will hand over Colosseum to NSF as well, and will be also an, under this power project, right? So we may actually end up using Colosseum for, for doing emulation. And finally, when, when everything is passed, the checks, and you're satisfied with your experiment, you submit your request for actually doing the experiment. And that's when you as a user start interacting with us as the operator. That's when we take over and we schedule your experiment and we run your experiment. Nowadays, we need to have visual observers, as I mentioned. So if you have five UAVs in your experiment, we need to have set up five pilots there that observe each pilot observing one UAV. That's how things stand now. And you get the results. You observe what's going on in your experiment, and you retrieve your result, and that's it. Um, in terms of cost, it's easy, and you get a lot of resources to do all those things. But once you actually use the test bed, uh, it might become crowded because of other test, test bed activities going on. So we're not try necessarily trying to run 15 experiments in parallel. Our approach, our vision is to have this large scale capability where experimenters can use a wide field of radios and wide field of, of area, right, to run an experiment. And uh, in order to use the test bed, eventually there will be some sort of token system because, as I mentioned, NSF sponsors it. So it's NSF wants NSF researchers to use part of the test bed. Industry sponsoring the radio equipment mostly. They will get also uh, usage time on the test bed. And then the rest is for general users, uh, researchers, other companies, and so forth. And the cost structure is not yet defined, but as you can imagine, we need to be sustainable after the project is over. The project runs for five years, then we need to be sustainable to run the test bed beyond. Okay, let me conclude with a few research examples uh, that we found interesting in order, in order to, for us to decide to build such a test bed. So one is with SRS LTE, we set up a base station on the ground somewhere in the field, open field, uh, and this is a real experiment. And we flew an SRS, uh, UE, which is uh, like a 4G LTE UE, uh, we mounted it on a, on a small quadcopter drone and uh, with a software radio from Atos, and we flew it, and we measured the received signal strength. So interestingly, uh, we observed that it's not only you lose signal based on your distance, but based on the actual position, right? So it all depends on your RF antenna design patterns, how, they are, how the antennas are designed. And maybe you do to multipath, you get some uh, fading. So in, if you want to, if let's say AT&T or Verizon or any other company wants to provide 3D coverage, then we need to study how to provide this seamless coverage, right? Either with beams, like in 5G you want to, it's a beam-based technology possibly, right? You want to deploy beams in the air or omnidirectional, but with a with today's technology, it's, the coverage is not guaranteed, and, and many other papers have shown that with measurements and simulations. Another interesting area is trajectory optimization. Let's assume you want to fly from here to here. So you can fly the shortest path, but maybe the shortest path does not give you seamless connectivity with, with some ground network, right? So if you don't have seamless connectivity, and this is connectivity is in the air, of course, um, you, another path may be more optimal. And uh, the, th the third example, the final example, uh, this is something I'm interested in. I'm interested in wireless research and wireless security, protocol security. Uh, I was with Virginia Tech. We did some great research with Mark Lichtman, who's here on LTE 4G, 4G security. Uh, we tried to see is LTE secure against control channel jamming, essentially, or spoofing. And we found it's not, it's easily, uh, this, uh, its performance drops significantly if you have some smart interference there. And there, is, there are big government programs that want to use 5G for military missions, right? So here what we want to do is we want to analyze 5, 4G and 5G networks and make them more robust against RF signaling attacks and spoofing attacks and other types of cyber attacks. 
So you can imagine if you have UAVs flying, those UAVs can also be attackers, right? So they can try to smartly jam uh, some other users. And how are we going to do this? Well, we are going to do, I'm going to do the research, but as an AirPath platform representative, I'm going to offer you the tools to do the research, like interference waveforms, uh, KPIs, uh, key performance indicators, and performance measurement counters that you can observe of your 5G or 4G network to see uh, how much the interference affects your system performance. Okay, so I, I'm done. I'm almost done. I just want to, uh, to give this shout out. We want to work with you. We are so excited that we have the privilege to build this platform. And we want to work with you and work with the community, uh, with the software radio community, GNU radio community, to be our colleagues, collaborators, users, whatever your role you find uh, appropriate for yourself and your business. Um, we are constantly looking for expanding our region uh, of collaborators. And we're also hiring. I'm hiring at Mississippi State University. As I said, I'm a professor and I'm hiring students. But I also hire postdocs and research faculty. If you're interested in any of this, um, please contact me and, um, and join our team. Thank you very much. Um, and we even have time for a question, or maybe two, it's super short. Uh, congratulations for winning the award. And Thank you. Uh, so are you going to control the drones uh, if somebody is running wireless experiments, or like how is, is the pl flight path predetermined? Yeah, good question. So we can, d we can use autopilots, but we are in the control of programming the autopilots based on what you tell us you want to do. But for now, the FAA regulation requires one person to observe one oh, yeah. or control it directly. Correct. So it depends on the experiment. Okay. And of course, all the other vehicles, the uh, buses and so forth, they have their own routes, right? We don't change those routes. We just put our radios there. Yeah. Also, the other question is you're yeah, talking about beyond the line of sight. Yes. Um, I have a license. So far, there are only 47 licenses. Why was given to, up, to even operate beyond the line of sight? Do you think you can get, you can run any experiments yes. just beyond the line of sight? We are very confident. We have two experts in FAA licensing, and we have uh, other partners with North Carolina and through Mississippi State. There's the Azure Center of Excellence for unmanned aircraft systems. So we know what they need. And other companies like, I don't know, Facebook, Google, and so forth, they obtain these licenses, Boeing maybe. So we are confident that, that the more testing we do, we and others do, the easier it will be to obtain those licenses to do those kind of experiments. How, <coughs> how long is the project period for getting the test bed uh, ready for users? Great question. So after year one, you will be able to use it. And we already have some lead users. We will try to have things available for them to try out earlier. But next summer, we're going to have a summer school and a demo, and you can start using the test bed, testing out the test bed. After year three, the whole test bed should be operational. So great stuff. Uh, I'm wondering about the spectrum regulations. How are you dealing with getting licenses or authorities to, to transmit, given all the, the software-defined radios and the, the frequency coverages that they are they can access versus frequency licensing and regulations? Great question. So first of all, the licenses you get from FCC, they call them uh, innovation zone licenses. And they have provided many of those for uh, the other two test beds already being built. It goes from sub one gigahertz to 28 and 39 gigahertz. And then how are we going to ensure that the users behave? Well, two things the other test beds do, and we may copy them or do something differently. They do RF monitoring in real time as fast as they can, and they shut down the radios if something is out of, out of band. We are thinking maybe to use also RF uh, hardware filters. It depends how many licenses we have, how many operational bands we have. We may have a switch matrix with different filter ranges where we can operate uh, different frequencies safely because we have the hardware filters. Thank you. All right. Well, there's no more questions. We can have a long, drawn-out <laughs> round of applause for Book. Um,